So where are you in this debate? Right, so I think Clarida has made it very clear that uh, December FOMC meeting is live in terms of a potential increased uh, pace of tapering. So that represents a, a, a potential uh, hawkish shift, right, in terms of uh, the Fed path. Now, I, I think uh, markets will be very jittery going into uh, two events. One, the next CPI print coming up, they are going to be looking at that very closely and trying to determine what the Fed uh, threshold for uh, inflation is going to be. And second, going into the December FOMC meeting. And I think, you know, with equities in the U.S. Uh, being at the heights uh, where they are currently, we could see some very sharp near-term volatility if we get a shock. OK, let's also look at uh, the bond purchasing program in a bit more detail and uh, how this may differ, if at all, if we get a change in the Fed uh, uh, chairship. But, of course, it wouldn't take place till February. But, uh, again, uh, Jerome Powell is seen as favourite, but uh, Brainard could be a surprise pick. What would happen? Absolutely. And, you know, uh, and therein lies, I think, the difficulty that investors are facing right now, right? So uh, this week we're going to get more colour on the new Fed chair. Right, and uh, Brenna is going to represent a dovish shift, right? So if that happens, we could see a boost deepening. We could see Treasury yields being supported. But remember that historically, new Fed chairs tend to be tested by markets as well, right? So that represents potential for near-term volatility, uh, particularly for equities. But on the other hand, we've discussed about the risk of a hawkish shift uh, later in December during the FOMC meeting. So I think this is quite a lot for markets to take right now, and uh, I think. Uh, we could be range bound going into the next few weeks as we uh, look for, uh, you know, uh, where the Fed path is likely going to be. Eli, has it surprised you also, given some of these inflation forecasts, which are looking quite scary, some of them, in fact, I had Jason Schenker on earlier and he was suggesting we could get a CPI rate of 7% in December. You know, what's your take on this? Because it doesn't seem even that the short end is really reacting as much as one would have thought. Right. I, well, seven is um, a little high versus my estimates. But look, I think over the near term, it is quite clear that inflationary pressures are going to continue, right? But when you break it down, and that's key, right? Most of these pressures are clearly linked to uh, supply chain bottlenecks, disruptions, uh, perhaps, you know, a, a temporary fall in the participation rate in the U.S. labor market so far. So there is still a very strong case to be made that we will see uh, inflation pressures wane next year and trend back towards the 2% level uh, at the end of next year. And look at the, the risk reward of the Fed's decisions right now, right? So if they turn hawkish too early and cause a, you know, a major disruption in the markets, it's going, to be, it's going to put them in a very awkward position. It's going to be very hard for them to turn again to try to alleviate uh, you know, any negative impact they've had. So I think that the base case is that the Fed will likely stay on their path and take a few more months to watch how inflation is uh, playing out. And on the other hand, we've got Europe dealing with uh, quite a different set of issues here, inflation one of them, but uh, don't forget also the surge in COVID cases. That's, that's, that's a huge wall cut, right? So I, I think it, if you look at a seven-day uh, moving average of cases, it is actually uh, at the last print higher than what we saw during the peak in November last year. And that, I think that is absolutely stunning. I think this is a wild card that investors have to look very closely at. Uh, this could uh, affect, you know, uh, the growth outlook, which is really a key component of what's been supporting markets so far. Give us a sense of uh, how you read that. Right. So I, I think the PBOC report suddenly I think indicates that uh, they will be easing from henceforth, and and we likely had seen a uh, rate of uh, the rate of credit growth bottomed from here. So I, I think they, they, they're clearly signaling two things. One, they are comfortable with diverging with uh, DM in terms of monetary policy. So IE, we are likely going to see the Fed tightening from here, but the Chinese economy is facing a cross, uh, you know, set of head, uh, crosswinds. So they will likely ease from here. That's number one. And number two, now as an investor, I think it's important to note that we're not going to see the kind of major policy U-turn that we've seen in the past, right? They've made it clear that this will be very targeted this will be very calibrated. And in fact, we don't think it's likely that they're going to uh, drop policy rates and, uh, anytime soon, as, uh, definitely not for the rest of this year. And in, in, instead, focus on providing liquidity to the sectors that they're focusing on, right? So property, green industries, and SMEs. 
So a lot of people said this should be a, uh, a triple R cut by year's end. In, in fact, many people have been predicting this ever since we saw the Evergrande blow up take place. So you, you, they haven't done that. Will they do that in your view? Or is it something that they perhaps are looking at, at uh, being too blunt an instrument and they need something uh, perhaps more strategic? Absolutely. I think at this point in time, they're likely holding that in reserve. I don't see a triple R cut uh, for the remainder of this year, right? So I think they still, uh, as a strategic priority, are keeping their long-term goals of, you know, uh, keeping the gains that they've made in curbing uh, excessive system leverage, in trying to curb excessive, uh, you know, uh, bubble-like behavior in the property sector. And they are, they are saying that they are quite comfortable with a slower and more healthy rate of growth going forward. So in my view, it's not likely we'll see a triple R cut this year. Or we may not uh, this year. So, OK, what sense are you getting from uh, corporate reports and indeed some of the market action as well of the state of the Chinese economy? And uh, give us a sense of whether you would be an investor here from an equity or a fixed income perspective. Right. So on one hand, um, on a broad market level, I think the downside risks are contained, right? So valuations are, are as low as we've seen in a very long time. Uh, that's number one. Number two, earnings growth continue to be fairly he healthy. But on the other hand, I think that the headwinds that we see to the economy in terms of, uh, you know, maybe slightly more disappointing uh, than expected credit growth uh, policies, uh, still a lot of uh, issues in the energy sector that's curving output. I think these, sec you know, these factors are going to keep a uh, medium-term growth outlook subdued for a fair bit. And I would say instead of being long the broad you know, Chinese equity market, this is more a stock pickers market, right? So I do think, for instance, there are many opportunities in the Chinese tech sector that look oversold. And these have rebounded and done fairly well uh, for some time now. But, and then you look at things like that, uh, the PPI read, which is historically at the highest levels that we've seen for decades, the thing of 26 years or something like that, that's got to be a cause of concern. I mean, does that feed into CPI? Because it hasn't done in the past, but, you know, with the levels being elevated as they are, what does it actually mean? Right. So I, I think, you know, the, I think the, the PPI uh, read highest, as, uh, you know, in a very long time, as you said, really speaks to the challenges that, that the economy is facing, right? So, um, as you know, China is keeping to its uh, you know carbon emissions uh, you know uh, commitment, especially as we go into the Olympics next year, they are going to continue uh, facing uh, tremendous challenges in the energy sector, right? And that's that's going to be a headwind to the economy at least over the next three to six months, in my view, which is why I do think that investors should refrain from uh, taking an overweight position in the in the overall uh, Chinese markets, for instance, and really focus on the few sectors that are, you know, priorities in terms of the government in uh, receiving support and also beneficiaries of really the, the growing middle class, right, which is, uh, for instance, the domestic consumption sector. Eli, very quickly, how deep is the slowdown in China? I think we are likely to see a 100 to 200 basis point dip in terms of GDP growth next year versus this year. And a lot will depend on uh, the amount of uh, easing that we see uh, next year and the pain threshold that the government has for slower growth next year as well. I am ultimately optimistic on the long-term growth of China's outlook, and I will be uh, looking to add if prices fall significantly from here.